Welcome to our next Research Toolbox, the 10-minute presentation. Um, quick question for those of you in the audience. How many of you have had to give a 10-minute presentation at a conference? Ah, lots of different people. Um, and uh, how stressful was that, trying to actually condense maybe a year's worth of research into 10 lousy minutes? Not so easy. Um, how many of you have actually attended a conference where they were doing either 10 minute or 15 or 20 minute presentations? So you've seen the really good ones and you've seen the really painful ones. And hopefully you're somewhere in the middle and on the, the closer side to, to good rather than painful. The goal today is to walk you through some of the key things to keep in mind as you're um, doing a 10 minute presentation. Um, significantly more um, conferences as they're trying to jam in more content are actually doing these shorter and shorter presentations. So this is a chance to see what's a little bit different about doing those kinds of presentations. Now, um, from my perspective, it's a lot easier to show than tell, or at least to show first and then tell. And so um, what I'm going to do with, with your kind indulgence is actually give you a presentation twice. Um, essentially a version that is probably a, a more typical conference attending version of the conf uh, that, that has some of the rules that are that, that are broken, if you will. And then a second round of the exact same presentation, but with a different script and a different way of doing it. One of the things in order to at least try to make it um, not obvious, a, a, oh, well, the reason that it's different is you've added cool, flashy pictures and new animations. I'm not going to do any photos or any, you know, extra images that way, but strictly use the same specific um, look and feel of the, um, the actual slide deck and um, use just strictly the option of words and bar charts and figures and things like that. I will also say that um, it's been a while since I've personally given a 10 minute presentation. I was actually going through my, my sort of set of presentations um, and realized that um, this presentation that I've done before is the before and after version um, is actually getting a bit long in the tooth. It's from um, 2005, I believe it was, was when um, it was first presented at the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine meeting. And um, the reason is that lately I've been asked to do keynotes and they're like 30 minutes or 45 minutes and I suddenly have this huge luxury of time to present things. So. Just you, you may look at this and go, whoa, references from 1998? Seriously? It was a thing then. So um, just, just keep in mind that the data itself is probably a bit old. And for some of you, it might even be a nice blast to the past. But what I want you to be paying attention to is actually how the talk is structured and how it's being presented. And I have asked... Um, Jen in our group to be the, the evil timekeeper of, um, of most conferences to give the, the five minute warning and the one minute warning and the stop now um, presentation um, opportunity. So um, that way we can sort of keep on time with that 10 minutes. All right. Any questions about what we're going to do? And, and essentially after the first set of, of presentation and the second set, then we'll have a specific conversation about some of those, um, those key findings. Good to go? All right. I am a regular researcher. I've just been introduced. The, the symposium is open. It's a concurrent session with 12 other sessions. There are probably five people in the room, maybe 10 because there's all these other places to go. Sound familiar? All right. Good afternoon. My talk is going to be about the hazards of stigma, um, the sexual and physical abuse of gay, lesbian, and bisexual adolescents in the United States, 1990-2015. 
and Canada. And I would like to thank my, um, oops, my, my co-authors and my full research team who are part of this research, Dr. Linda Berenger and Dr. Michael Resnick and Dr. Sandra Pedengel and Dr. Carol Skay and Elizabeth Reese from um, Seattle and um, Christopher Carlson, who is one of our research team members. So studies have documented um, that uh, lesbian, gay, and bisexual teens face several risks in coming out. Um, they often experience negative and violent responses um, in families, um, especially around physical abuse and rejection, and some of the research um, is, is shown there by Dajeli and, and Hirschberger and Pilkington and uh, Murphy, Sidhu, and Tonkin in Canada. Um, in schools and in communities, and these are things like bullying and hate crimes and um, um, a lot of, of different sort of harassment in schools. And um, the limitations of the studies that have been done to date have been that most of them are convenient samples of um, self-identified LGB youth who are out in the community. So they're drawn from drop-in centers or they're drawn from other kinds of places um, where LGB youth might congregate. And um, what ends up being a part of that challenge is that they also tend to be disproportionately focused on lesbian and gay teens and um, combining all of the um, results together for LGB youth. So you don't necessarily see if there's any differences for, for lesbian, gay, or bisexual teens. So um, one of the issues is that sexual and physical abuse is a contributing factor to a lot of health different, different health outcomes. And among these, it's actually the strongest predictor of various youth risk behaviors. Um, research has documented in the general population things like um, substance abuse and higher rates of violence involvement and weapon carrying among people who have experienced sexual and physical abuse. Um, suicide attempts and suicidal thoughts are also much higher among those who have been abused. Um, we see risky sexual behaviors, including teen pregnancy involvement, and um, that we think that perhaps um, that higher risk among people who have been abused is that some of these risk behaviors may be attempts to cope with abuse trauma. So with sexual minority youth, we actually see that there's a higher prevalence of the, the various risk behaviors among lesbian, gay, and bisexual youth. And um, they're also more likely to report a history of sexual victimization than their heterosexual peers. In fact, for the longest time, it seemed like um, people were thinking that that higher rate of sexual abuse actually contributed to causing homosexuality or um, um, people being gay, lesbian, and bisexual, and that was a big um, piece of the conversation in um, research in the 1980s. Um, and as I said, the um, study samples have predominantly focused on gay um, men and gay boys, or they combine gay and bisexual people in the same bit, and there's less research that has specifically focused on bisexual youth. So the purpose of our study was actually to compare the self-reported experiences of sexual and physical abuse among students in six population-based school health surveys in the U.S. and Canada, and the comparisons of bisexual youth to everybody else, so heterosexual, mostly heterosexual, gay, and lesbian peers of the same age, because as we know from research, um, Gay, lesbian, and bisexual teens tend to come out later than heterosexual teens, and so in most surveys, they're older on average, so you have to kind of compare the same ages to make sure that you have um, apples to apples. Um, so the surveys that I will be um, talking about actually include the British Columbia Adolescent Health Survey, which is a cluster stratified weighted sample of grade students in grades 7 through 12. And it has been conducted every five years since um, 1992. But so we have BC, um, the 1992 survey included a weighted sample of 237,748, which was weighted to um, represent the um, um, the enrollment in the province. Likewise, in 1998, you see the 278,000. Oh, okay, so, so um, 
Anyways, so then there's the Minnesota student surveys where they actually use a measure of sexual orientation that's a little different. So it's only 25,000 students from their census survey. And in Seattle, it's just the city. And so they have the census survey of that. Um, so the measures of sexual orientation, we actually used um, um, sexual attraction and self-labeling in the British Columbia and in Seattle, where people identified heterosexual, uh, mostly heterosexual was only in BC, and um, bisexual and gay and lesbian. So example is that people have different feelings when it comes to being attracted to others, which best describes your feelings. And then in Minnesota, they actually only just had the gender of sexual partners in the past year, which is a, a less effective measure, but it was just marked as opposite gender, both gender or same gender only. So then for measures of abuse, we had lots of different measures. The um, BC and, and Seattle had forced intercourse. There was a single item of sexual abuse on the BC Adolescent Health Surveys about being touching or being forced to do something against your will. Um, and then in Minnesota, we had both incest and non-family abuse and physical abuse that was limited to just abuse within the family and that was not assessed in Seattle. Um, our analysis was conducted separately by gender because of the differences in abuse and we actually looked at bisexual separately from gay and lesbian and we did logistic regressions um, for calculating odds ratios and then cross tabs with chi-square. Um, okay, so I um, don't know if you can see this, but essentially sexual abuse rates were higher for lesbian and bisexual girls compared to heterosexual girls in all the surveys except for BC 1992 bisexual girls. And um, as you can see here, we have um, the um, sexual abuse and forced intercourse across all the different girls. So bisexuals are the ones in red and lesbians are the ones in purple. And as you can see, they are mostly higher on most of those. Um, when it comes to boys, we also see, again, um, a, a higher the blue and the reds are the bisexual and gay and um, lesbian whereas the heterosexual are very small and the mostly heterosexual is the the paler gray there now when it comes to age adjusted odds ratios of that sexual abuse um, as you can see we have significantly higher odds of abuse among the different groups and this is comparing to heterosexuals as the the referent group and the odds ratios range from um, 5.4 and 5.2 in, in the uh, different surveys as high as 10.9 for um, boys in uh, BC in 1998 and then for girls those odds ratios are a little bit lower and they're not significant in 1992 in BC and Minnesota but um, they are still two or three times in the other surveys. Um, when it comes to sexual abuse, comparing bisexual to gay and lesbian, there is um, pretty much no difference across all of the different um, surveys. Um, when it comes to physical abuse, as you can see, um, gay and bisexual boys and um, the mostly heterosexual boys have higher rates than the, the heterosexual boys, and that prevalence is as much as um, one in three or the 33.5% um, and uh, for bisexual boys it's um, the highest is 27.3%. For girls the rates are even higher and they are 43% um, is the highest in Minnesota and um, likewise in um, uh, among the other different groups. Oh um, right so the odds adjusted ratios are, are quite also higher so um, let me talk about briefly the limitations. The sampling, of course, across the different surveys is an important issue, and um, we have differences in measuring orientation from different places. Um, these are cross-sectional, so we don't necessarily have the ability to do the timing, and it relies on self-report, which um, may be both sensitive or stigmatized. Um, there are lots of conclusions, um, specifically that they are at higher risk, as we said, and so we really um, think that perhaps that abuse history, sexual or physical, can help explain the increased risk behaviors we see. And that we really should, if you're comparing the different risk behaviors across sexual orientation, you should control for abuse if possible. Um, forced intercourse is only one type of sexual abuse, and although that's used most commonly on surveys, it's, we recommend that you should consider using other measures. Um, the clinicians, oh, um, 
So uh, thank you. Any questions? Okay, that was that presentation. And now for presentation number two. Good afternoon. You can see it on television, hear it in the hallways at school, read it in our court rulings and in laws passed in southern states. Um, from a very early age, most people in the U.S. and Canada absorb the message that there is something wrong with being gay or bisexual or anything but straight. Even with long-standing media visibility, like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy or the Miley Cyrus Kiss, um, legalizing gay marriage in Canada and now in the USA, the prevailing messages in society are still negative. That's so gay is still a frequent pejorative term in middle schools and high schools. And while some teens are beginning to self-identify, this is not necessarily safe. Studies in the U.S. and Canada have documented the anxious, angry, and even violent responses LGB youth get from their families, schools, and in the community. However, most of those studies have focused um, on convenient samples of LGB youth who are publicly out. These experiences may not fit all teens who self-identify during adolescence. At the same time, sexual and physical abuse are among the most potent predictors of youth risk behaviors like drug abuse, suicide, and teen pregnancy. In part, these risk behaviors may be less than optimal attempts to cope with the trauma from that abuse. In the past decade, several studies have reported a higher prevalence of these risk behaviors among sexual minority youth, too. And some of the same surveys have identified a higher risk of harassment and sexual violence for these teens. The majority of these teens have focused on um, gay youth or have combined gay and bi teens into a single category. And so less is known about the experiences of bisexual teens. So as part of a larger study of the health and risk behaviors of bisexual teens in population-based surveys, our purpose was to compare the self-reported experiences of sexual and physical abuse among youth in six different health surveys, comparing bi youth to heterosexual, mostly heterosexual, and gay or lesbian peers. The surveys were all conducted during the 1990s um, within the U.S. and Canada. Four surveys were state or province-wide, and two were from a major city on the West Coast. The measures of sexual orientation varied within the different surveys. Seattle and BC had a self-labeling measure that defined the labels on the basis of attraction, and Minnesota surveys only asked about the gender of sexual partners in the past 12 months. Although attraction and behavior are not always congruent with orientation and self-identity, uh, for brevity in this presentation, I'll use the same convention of hetero, mostly hetero, bi, and gay or lesbian for each survey. But keep in mind, these labels are not necessarily accurate for the students who indicate only attraction or recent behavior. Similarly, the measures of sexual abuse in the different surveys varied. Several surveys use the youth risk behavior survey measure of ever experiencing forced sexual intercourse. This can undercount actual abuse history, of course, since traumatizing sexual abuse need not include intercourse. Other surveys asked a more global question about sexual abuse that included unwanted sexual touching. The Minnesota surveys asked two separate questions, one assessing incest within the family and the other assessing sexual physical violence outside the family. The items for physical abuse were limited to physical violence within the family and neither of the Seattle surveys included them. All of our analyses were conducted separately for boys and girls, with bisexual teens compared to each other orientation group. We used logistic regressions to calculate age-adjusted odds ratios of the risk of abuse for bi teens compared to the other groups, and we used cross-tabs with chi-square to examine the prevalence of abuse by orientation. In all the surveys except Seattle, girls were more likely to report abuse than boys, but the differences between orientation groups were more marked among boys. Among girls, lesbian and bi girls reported the highest prevalence of sexual abuse, shown here in purple and violet. Anywhere from one in four to nearly twice that many reported a history of sexual abuse, while the hetero and mostly hetero girls 
were just about half as likely to report abuse. Their prevalence still ranged from just under 10 to just over 25%. In contrast, look at the, header, the, the prevalence of sexual abuse or forced intercourse reported by boys. Well under 10% of hetero and mostly hetero boys reported sexual abuse, but gay and boy, bi boys are nearly as likely as bi and lesbian girls to report abuse, and for most of them, more than one in four in the surveys. Except for girls in Minnesota in 1992, bi teens were significantly more likely to report sexual abuse compared to their heterosexual age mates. Among boys, the age-adjusted odds ratios range from 5 to almost 11, and for girls, most odds ratios are 2 or higher. This means that bi boys were up to 10 times as likely, and bi girls were twice as likely to report abuse compared to hetero peers their same age. Differences were generally not significant between gay, lesbian, and bisexual teens. In the three surveys that assessed physical abuse, gay and bi boys also report a higher prevalence, with one-fourth to one-third reporting abuse compared to just over 10% of hetero boys. So do lesbian and bi girls. The age-adjusted odds ratios of physical abuse show that bi teens have twice the odds of abuse compared to hetero teens, except for Minnesota in 1992. However, in half the surveys, gay or lesbian teens are at higher risk for physical violence than bi teens. There are a number of limitations that should be noted for this study. First, there are regional differences in the survey sampling methods and the ethnic mix. Um, and so prevalence estimates shouldn't be directly compared between the different regions. There are also differences in how sexual orientation was measured in each survey that can also influence results. In particular, Minnesota's measure of orientation is quite limited since it requires teens to actually have recent sexual activity, but the majority of teens are not sexually active. With this measure, there's a greater chance for teens to be misclassified compared to self-identity too. Further, sexual orientation um, is a developmental task of adolescence, and so some teens may not yet identify as LGB who will eventually do so. Because these are all cross-sectional surveys, it's impossible to determine whether the abuse or sexual minority identity occurred first, or whether the abuse was because the teen had, teen had come out as gay, lesbian, or bi. As I said, researchers as recently as the mid-80s have wondered about the opposite, whether abuse actually caused a homosexual orientation. Please note, the majority of LGB youth did not report a history of abuse, so this would tend to rule out abuse as a causal link for orientation. And as always, these are school-based surveys that rely on self-report, so they may not re represent those who are not in school, um, who generally report even higher levels of abuse and violence. And in a crowded classroom, sensitive questions such as sexual and physical abuse may be left unanswered. Even so, our conclusions are sobering. There appears to be a distinct hazard of abuse for sexual minority youth compared to heterosexual teens. Up to 40% of lesbian and bi girls and a third of gay and bi boys report abuse experiences, twice to 10 times the risk that heterosexual teens of the same age report. This increased risk for abuse may help explain those higher levels of risk behaviors reported among LGB youth. So given this higher risk of abuse, studies which compare risk behaviors by orientation should probably control for sexual or physical abuse whenever possible. It's important for adolescent health surveys to actually include a measure of sexual victimization. But researchers should be aware that forced intercourse is a limited measure of this, and we must advocate for better measures of sexual abuse in school-based health surveys. Well, healthcare providers should routinely screen for abuse among all of their patients. This is even more important for LGBT youth. And then we must be able to provide appropriate therapy or referrals. We need to raise awareness among families and communities about the violence directed at our LGBT teens and find ways to foster support within the teens' environments. A young person's orientation shouldn't be an added hazard to his or her health. But as long as our society continues to stigmatize anyone who isn't heterosexual, our gay, lesbian, and bisexual teens will continue to be at rest, at home, at school, and in the community. Thank you very much. Any questions? It didn't beep. You have 46 seconds left. I've got 46 <laughs> seconds left.
and I covered the same content. So what do you think? Let's compare and contrast these two presentations. What did you see differently? Because they really covered pretty much the same content, and some of the slides were identical as well. Right. Um, <clears throat> the first one was obviously you read the slides um, and said um a lot. And the second one was more of a story and rehearsed and, and very coherent, which I appreciated. Um, that's what stood out to me first and most. Obviously, the, it was really messy to try to interpret the numbers on the graphs, and so it was, it was easier for you to be able to walk through the, what the figures meant, which was allowable. So it was a much more cleaner uh, presentation than the second one, which was great. Other observations? Yes. I think with the second one, you had to dish up the research very obviously, and that thread carried throughout. But the first one, you didn't maybe understand the purpose as much, and I don't even, I'm not quite sure. I can remember if there was a purpose slide. Probably there was. There was. Question, but it just didn't. But it was a ways in, yeah. It took you five minutes to get there. Yeah, so that would be maybe the first thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, the setup was a little long um, for that first one, um, which is often quite common. Other observations? Yeah. Aside from the fact that the slides were dated. Yeah, and then for the first presentation, too, I realized there was some sort of emphasis from some details that were not really necessary. For instance, uh, according to the research from, like, actually, citing the authors for a particular citation and then trying to describe all the real surveys. So that actually took a lot of time compared to the second one very much yes. one. So you can actually see the data that you are presenting. So you don't necessarily need right. to have all of that extra now, and, and this is something that often happens is that that you know we've done this research. We are totally geeked out about our research and we want to share every little detail about it. Um, but the audience doesn't necessarily need all of those in order to be able to understand and appreciate the rigor of what you've done and the, um, the specific methods of what you've done. Other things that people might have? Carla? I love the love presentation because the first time she reminded me so much of myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> have some 10-minute presentation easy things to do, and these are some, some 10 tips, if you will, um, that, uh, that can help. One of the things to remember is that when you have a 10 or 15-minute presentation, the average speaking speed for anyone is about 120 words a minute. It might be a little faster if you're nervous, but then people can't understand you as well. And when you're in a really large audience or where you remember that part of your audience is actually jet lagged or coming from another country and they speak with a different accent than yours, you need to speak even slower than you generally do. But 120 words means a 10 minute presentation gives you 1200 words, no more. And the minute you saw me digress and start expanding on what's going on, if you digress in a 10-minute presentation, you will, you'll have gone over automatically. And this is why I always say um, if, if a presentation is 15 minutes or fewer, even today, I will write it out. I will write the entire script of the presentation to make sure that it is not too long. Um, Oftentimes, I, I try to say, oh, well, you know, if it's a 10-minute presentation, I should only have 10 slides. The problem is that you can spend a lot of time talking about those 10 slides if you 
just talk around them and you will find yourself with suddenly no time and you have to zip through. Um, so writing it out from beginning to end is actually a really good strategy to make sure that you cover things. It also helps you balance your presentation. Um, so, you know, as I said, the number of slides equaling about the number of minutes unless a slide is a really simple picture or figures and you're keeping the amount of words to less than 120 that are talking about that figure or picture. So if it's a figure that someone can grasp really easily and you're just going to say a few things about it, then that ends up being okay to have more than that. I will tell you that both of these presentations, there were like 21, 22 slides. So twice as many as you would normally have. The first time around, that was deadly because I had to then zip through to try to get to the, the key pieces and I had to skip stuff. And I'm sure you've all been in presentations where you've seen someone who comes in for a 15 minute presentation with a slide deck of 45 slides and they're at minute five or six before they finally get through the background and what you're really there to cover is the methods and the results and the so what piece of it at the end. So that taking that extra time um, to do the setup is a, is a bit of a challenge. Another really key piece is keeping those slides brief and clear. There should be no more than three or four points. So seven to ten lines on a slide. And they should be phrases, not full-on sentences. And it's really important to keep in mind the size of your font. If you're using PowerPoint to create your slides, go for the smallest one being 20-point font better 24 point font as your smallest. That was a difference between the first one and the second one for me. Um, because as you see, this is 18 point font and this is a big projector that is showing a bigger slide deck than is often visible in some of the, uh, the slide presentation in, in banquet halls that you do. And so it's really hard to see this. And of course, that other important thing, keep the tables and the figures simple and avoid having too many bars or too many lines or too many numbers. Um, the precision, you don't need that second decimal place. You don't need the confidence intervals. You don't need the Wald statistic or the F statistic or the chi-square because all of that can be in your paper that you get published that kind of precision. Instead, you need to make it so that people can see and visually capture and go, ah, okay, I see what you're doing. And that's where bar charts can actually make it better than big long tables. And where tables that have teeny tiny font, if you ever say, okay, um, you might not be able to see this, but epic fail. If you have to apologize for a slide, it should not be in there. End of sentence. Absolutely. That's like the cardinal rule. Never, ever, ever apologize for your presentation. Fix your presentation. Um, so that's, that's an important one in terms of thinking about how much detail do you take out. Um, it's been my experience that a lot of people put way too much setup of the presentation. A lot of their background, their literature review, and all of those pieces, and they take too much time with that. You need to cut straight to what's my purpose. It's okay to like do some setup, but if you think about it, you probably had to write an abstract to submit to, a, um, to the conference to begin with, and that purpose or that background was probably two sentences, maybe three. That's your slide, and don't bother putting in the references because you don't need to. If people really want your references, you can put a slide at the very end with your references, but generally speaking, most of the time, if people really need that, they will ask you, well, what do you mean there's all this? And then you can say, because you can have the notes with you, oh, well, you know, Mays and Cochran in 2001 said this, and then you look really smart. But really, just having them on there as bolstering your authority is not going to help because it takes away from the time to talk about your project and your research. Um, other things in terms of... of um, slides, having those consistent fonts. Don't keep switching fonts or don't have more than one font on a page, you know, the two fonts or three fonts. 
Um, blinking ones, deadly. Don't go there. Um, part of it is you want to remember that your audience, some of whom are jet lagged, some of whom were up really late last night getting together with their friends, um, some of whom arrived really early because they also are working in the same conference venue um, and they're thinking about 20 million other things. They don't want to have to work and they, your slides are an add-on or an adjunct to your presentation. They're sort of audio-visual. They're not, they're not your presentation. They're supposed to be those visual cues to help your presentation. So from that perspective, you want to really think about simple fonts, dark backgrounds and light letters, can be more leg legible. Lately, I've seen more of the um, lighter fonts with black, but the big thing is make sure you've got really strong contrast, because if you've got a blue background and a, a reddish slide, so like this color for your letters and this color for your background, they blend into each other and you can't actually see the letters because the saturation is the same. So you need high contrast, really di dark and really light as those those pieces. Now you notice I didn't add any pictures. Pictures really can add pizzazz and that can be helpful, but they need to be really relevant for your topic. They need to be crisp and clear and easy for people to access um, in terms of, you know, if you've got a picture of a, I don't know, an ultrasound that's got one little piece of it that you want to be using a laser pointer on, unless it's absolutely critical for your research results, don't bother. Um, Likewise, cutesy graphs and cartoons and things can often misfire. Um, humor can be tricky to translate across groups. And a lot of times cartoons have a great image and then a little teeny tiny caption at the bottom that's the punchline, and that's not visible. And so it's, it's better to avoid those if you can. And instead go with pictures that are crisp and clear and specifically fit your topic. Now, if you don't have pictures, you know, I'm talking about sexual abuse. What kind of pictures am I going to show? Not so good. So in this case, I opted for not using any photos, but instead the visual images being the bar charts and, um, and potential figures that way. So adding oomph to that delivery that sets you apart from everybody else. Grab people in the first 15 seconds after you've said, good morning, and I have no disclosures. Um, if you're at a conference that does CEM CMEs and you have to say whether or not you have any conflicts. Um, use a compelling statement. Um, an unexpected startling statistic that is something that might be a really effective strategy. Or a contrast of ideas between what's expected. Um, a dramatic story can be a really useful one as long as it's pertinent um, and doesn't distract, it's very on topic. Um, jokes sometimes don't work so well. Um, you're not necessarily a stand-up comedian, and most people coming to hear a research presentation are not really waiting for you to say, so on the way over here, I met this guy, and, and have a conversation or a, a joke to sort of set people at ease that's oftentimes sort of self-denigrating, and that doesn't work so well. Some of the other pieces, even if you're reading, which I did, um, it's really important to vary that tone and pitch so that you're not doing constant monotone, but it's also important to avoid upspeak. You might have heard me the first time around doing that a lot. Um, this is something that's really common, especially in, um, I've noticed in Canada and the U.S., that people will tend to end what should be a declarative sentence that goes down with a declarative sentence. And it's sort of a way of linguistically trying to bring people in. That sort of, you know what I mean? Okay? You agree with me? And that's kind of the way we use it in regular day-to-day -day speaking. Unfortunately, when you do that when you're talking about your results, it actually sounds like you're uncertain about your results. And so instead of coming across as drawing everybody in, you come across as, please don't hate me, I'm not quite sure what these results are, or I'm, I'm really new at this, or I'm uncertain or inexperienced, and you are an expert in the research that you've done. So it's better to be um, varying your tone, but always making sure that you end any of these declarative statements on a down, this is a period, yes, I have said this. Um, 
It's also okay to be informal about it, though. You can make it that conversational sort of discussion, um, you know, just between you, me, and the other 500 people there. And part of that is actually making sure that you're looking up. You may not actually be making eye contact, but it looks like you're making eye contact. You're not just doing this, but if you're like me and you can't actually do that without losing your place, left finger is really good to be following along and then stop, look up, and then go to the next, and that way you, you continue. I actually put in my slides the where to change the slide as well as a mark so that I remind myself when to go. It is really a good idea to pause for emphasis or to pause to let people read a slide that you've just given them the bar chart. It's okay to do that. That actually draws people's attention. Whoa, they stopped. Are they done? No? What am I looking at? It's, it's a cue that rather than rushing along and speaking really fast because you've got to get it all in, let people see the visual and draw conclusions from it and just give them a little brief and then wait. Of course, in your head, you're counting to 27 and it feels like forever for that, but it's only been, you know, 10, 15 seconds. It's also important to avoid jargon, colloquialism, slang, acronyms, because not everybody in the audience is necessarily going to know them, unless you've already sort of specified them at the very beginning. Oops. Don't read. And in fact, one of the things that they found is that if you have a slide up there and you're actually saying something slightly differently rather than reading the slide itself, it draws people's attention more. Don't ask me why, because you would think that that would be a sort of cognitive dissonance. Like they're, they're like, I, I'm trying to do two things at once. But we understand with our ears slightly different from what we see with our eyes. And many times people read faster or slower than what's on the slide. But if you're reading it, your highly educated audience who reads a lot of stuff is going, I could have read that. You could have just sent me the slides. I don't need you to talk. So expanding on it a little bit, talking it in slightly different ways, actually includes or increases that, that um, interest. And it tells that story that draws people in. And as I said, don't apologize. If you can't read this, if it can't be seen, it shouldn't be shown. But there's another one, and I had this happen um, a few times. I've had this happen a lot of times. But in the olden days when we actually had slide carousels and being in a big conference room, you'd have like two screens and you had to like press two buttons to get the slides going. It was not uncommon that they would get out of sync. Or worse, a slide clicks and you it goes forward faster than you expect it to. Or you forget to change the slide and you've moved on to talking. That's difficult. But you stopping and going, oh, I'm sorry, and then backing up or calling attention to the fact that it's out of sync um, really makes it more noticeable. Whereas if instead you just pause, fix them, and then go forward without apologizing, people notice it less and it comes across as just a little more polished. Keep the technical details to a minimum. You run out of time. In a 10-minute presentation, you really cannot cover all the nitty-gritty bits about the statistics you used and why you use them and give that third decimal place, etc. Because you really need to leave room for that take-home message, that so what, why should we pay attention, why do we care, and what should we do about it? And that's the piece that you want to make sure that you've got room for at the very end. And if you've got too much stuff up front, you end up rushing, and that's the stuff that ends up getting cut. In fact, before you write your presentation, you really should know what is that one thing you absolutely want people to take home? And can it be said in a single sentence, 25 words or less? Because if you have that and you make sure that that's the last thing you say or the nearly last thing you say, then people will remember it. And if you're looping back from what you've said at the very beginning, 
that actually can be a very useful way of doing the presentation as well. That creates that full circle, that um, sense of a narrative. It's also good to actually signal the end. So have a slide that says thank you or questions, and then you actually say thank you. This is not the place for you to actually then say, and I'd like to thank my, you know, my team members and our funders. As long as the funding information is on the page, people can read. And you can leave that page up during question period, and then people can get that information. But it sort of ends up being, we've all seen it, the thanking your, all of your co-authors who are all visible on the slide, thanking the, the donor and everybody. This isn't the Academy Awards. Um, you got 10 minutes. Gratitude is for some other time. It's important to rehearse so that you have that confidence and, um, and so that you make sure that you've got time and that you've had that chance to work out the pauses. It's also important to smile, unless of course your topic is really grim, in which case be dramatically grim, but it's okay <laughs> to start at the beginning smiling to everybody and saying good morning and then after that you could be serious and somber but it, it's just it's it's that piece of if you aren't engaging and, and a smile and a hello and a good morning or a good afternoon are ways that you draw people in from the very beginning um, it's it's a way to to catch people's attention and part of really keeping people's attention is catching their attention you want to be careful not to pack too much into your talk. A 10-minute presentation doesn't leave you a lot of room. And if you're thinking about sort of the rule of thumb, your introduction shouldn't take more than a minute or two of your 10 minutes. Your methods should maybe be another minute or two. Your results should be two to three minutes. And that leaves you with two minutes at the end, one to two minutes at the end for your so what. And make sure that you have at least a good solid 120 words, one minute, to make sure that people take that away. If that means you have to shorten your limitation section, so be it. Then when people say, well, wait a minute, have you thought about it? You can say, yes, that is one of the limitations of my study when you're in question and answer period. But you don't have to have it as part of your presentation. When you have a really big audience, so this is for, you know, 30, for 50 to 150 people, but what if you're giving a talk to 800 people in a room that seems to go back forever and you've got two slide or, you know, or multiple slide decks going on so that people can see it? Then it becomes even more important that you go slower that you have fewer words on your slides because fewer people will be, I mean, you know, all the people in the way, way back are not going to be able to see them unless they're big words. And one of the things that I was told the first time I gave presentations was wear red, whether that's a red tie, a red suit jacket, a red scarf, a red blouse, a red dress. Um, wearing red is one of those alert signals in people's brains and it does help draw the eye, capture people's attention. More importantly, it allows people to find you after the talk. <laughs> and they can come up to you and say, oh, I heard your talk. This, um, I, I was like, oh, yeah, right, OK, whatever. I had an experience fairly early on in, in my career presenting at the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine meeting. I had two oral presentations in the same conference, two days apart. Um, I was really like, oh, okay, so the first day I wore the red jacket. Well, the second presentation, I'm thinking, I can't wear the same thing again. This is like, so I wore a gray dress with a, a gray and pink and blue scarf. Um, and I thought, oh, well, it was like, it's colorful. So, so that will be good enough. After my first presentation, when I wore the red jacket, and it was like this red, people came up to me for the rest of the conference. Even though I wasn't still wearing red, but that first day, they did after that. But they came up to me and said, 
your presentation, I'd like to ask you a question about it, or this was really great, it was really great. The second presentation, which I thought was actually more interesting information, nobody had questions. A couple people, oh, yeah, you presented, didn't you? That was, and then of course what they said you presented was about the other presentation I gave, not the, the second one. So it's like, it, it cues people, it does connect to their memories. And so it's worth sort of thinking about that. It's also really noticeable on the video, the red. Yes. I was surprised how much it pops more than the green. Than the green. So just one of those. And I mean, you know, there, there does come a point if you're giving a longer presentation or other things, you may not want to always have your signature red for everything you ever do. I have given memorable presentations without it, but um, it is one of those things that does help, especially if it's a large audience and especially when there are a lot of presentations going on. Um, it's just one of those, when you're one of the queue, sometimes it helps you stand out a little bit. Questions? Yes? You mentioned that you quite often write out your, your speaking notes, but I noticed that your, your sentence structure still not sounded quite conversational. Is there particular ways you do the writing so that it sounds yeah. more like spoken language rather than written? Because I've heard so many people read their speaking notes and it sounds like they're... Reading a peer-reviewed manuscript. Yes, no, I. that's a very good point. When I write out the script, it's write it out as if you're talking to grandma or to um, a fellow student or to um, your neighbor. And, and, you know, really thinking about, I'm just having a conversation with you, how am I going to write that, rather than writing it out as if you're writing a peer-reviewed paper, because that does tend to be a lot more formal sentencing, and that can come across as a little stuffy. So um, that ability to be precise, be accurate, share the appropriate scientific information, don't go beyond your research findings, but do so in a clear and friendly and accessible conversational way. Is, um, is a really good way. And yes, I do actually put all of that verbatim in my, so I write it as if I'm saying it, and then I go back and I count the words and I tweak it until I get down to what I need, but keep it conversational still. Some of these suggestions just take practice. Oftentimes you don't actually hear yourself saying um a lot, or you don't hear that you're using up speak until you've practiced it a bit. So having colleagues um, that you can rehearse with before you actually give the presentation can be a really helpful, especially if you're asking them to pay attention to those things and to pay attention to what's on the slides and to try to figure out, is this clear? Can this be explained to people for whom this might not be their primary topic area as opposed to everyone who's totally expert on it? Well, hearing no further questions, oh, unless there I are any. One more. On one more? Okay. Um, from Sandra, she asked, for people who don't have English as a first language, do you have any tips? So for people who don't have English as a first language as speakers, um, it's, it's really helpful to write out and read out your talk um, several times to make sure that you haven't inadvertently put words together that are tongue twisters. And that's actually good for anyone, regardless of, of what language you're presenting in. But it's also good to have that rehearsal where you've got folks who are primary English speakers to hear what you're saying and to help with the pronunciation or to help you with some of that cadence or, or um, tone pacing. It's also not a bad idea to remember that you can use the slides to show the picture or they, they convey key information and speak less, and that's still okay. In fact, if you've got clear, um, just um, friendly speaking or conversational speaking as part of your talk, then the slides, um, that usually ends up being shorter it usually ends up being less complicated pronunciation because it's not so many syllables in every word, and it's usually clearer. 
This is important for English speakers, though, too, because many times your audience may have English as another language. And so if you want to get that message across clearly, you can't speak too quickly or people can't translate in their head. You also can't speak too um, colloquially, too much slang, because that will just completely miss people, or say things that have, you know, that are really, really long words that people may not have regularly in their, um, in their repertoire of English. Um, it's also important to avoid at, um, acronyms for the simple reason that the acronyms are different in different languages. I remember my sabbatical at WHO, which is OMB in Switzerland. <laughs> um, so it is important to, to sort of try to remember in that respect. Do you have any tips for, uh, like, for audience, presenting to audiences that come from like a very, uh, a wide variety of mixed professional backgrounds? Like, I know I presented uh, at a conference where there was a, there was a lot of like, like quite high reputation professors in the field, but then also people who were peer workers, and it was difficult to kind of create the proper balance. Yeah, um, that's always a tricky one, and I would say that in tone err on the side of being less formal and more conversational. In content, make sure that what you're saying is not so informal that it's getting beyond what your actual research is and that it's okay for, because you've got that mixed audience, to be able to say, okay, so here are some of the statistical tests we used. What we were doing them for is, you know, this is why we did those things, so that you're, you're not assuming that everybody knows and that you're you're actually explaining because what's more important is the why you did it not what exactly you did statistically speaking um, and that's actually the case even for the um, the highly experienced senior researcher folks for the most part because they don't necessarily know all of those stats and use them all the time anyways themselves and even if they do they're far more interested in knowing why you wanted to use them because that's how they can check whether or not you're using the right ones um, is based on what you why what your purpose is in using them and then for those people in the audience for whom the statistics like make their eyes glaze over they understand what you're trying to do and and that makes it a little more accessible to both but it is that's that's a tricky one and i um you that ends up with that challenging moment of people then saying, like, you never know what your questions are going to be. Um, you'll get someone who asks a question about really practical, on the ground, how do you do stuff that you may not be able to answer. And then you get the other person who really geeks out on the stats and wants to know exactly what um, your statistical stuff was. Um, so it's a little trickier to be figuring out the question and answer period, but that's what the question and answer period is for. You get to keep your 10 minutes narrow and contained. But I see that we are done with our one hour time and I do want to keep you all on time. Thank you very much for being part of this and um, good luck with your next 10 minute presentations.